Welcome. It's my pleasure today to present to you the standards of medical care and diabetes for 2022. My name is Bob Gebe, and I'm privileged to serve as the Chief Scientific and Medical Officer for the American Diabetes Association. Our objective today is going to be to provide updates on the new aspects of our standards of care. Let me just start with a little bit of the process and, and how we arrive at the standards of care. We, of course, begin with the evidence, an, ext an extensive literature search in Medline and other sources for anything new in diabetes from the year prior. Uh, based on that, uh, there are a series of recommended amendments and changes and edits to the standards of care. This is then uh, uh, accomplished by a professional practice committee, an extraordinary group of individuals that represent many different professionals within the diabetes ecosystem, all experts in their field. Um, they debate, discuss, uh, and come up with consensus that is then presented uh, internally and reviewed by the American Diabetes Association. It is then taken to our board of directors uh, for approval. Um, and we, uh, several years ago, began a process where, um, given the rapidly changing nature of diabetes, if there are new things between these yearly publications, we have a living standard where we can make uh, changes along the way in between those yearly uh, periods. I also want to clarify around the funding. This is funded uh, uh, completely through internal ADA sources. We do not use any industry funding for these uh, standards. So with that, let me jump to each of the sections and I'll go section by section and again, highlight what's new. Let's start with the classification and diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, here, we made an important change, uh, and these are new screening thresholds. So for individuals uh, that are overweight or obese, over the age of 18, with risk factors, those individuals uh, should be uh, uh, tested for both diabetes and prediabetes diabetes through the usual measures. Um, the other big change is if people don't fit that criteria in terms of age 18 and risk factors, really all individuals should be screened for diabetes starting at age 35. That is a lowering of the threshold based on the evidence. Um, the other important items are that uh, if one screens normal at age 35 or somewhere between 18 and 35 based on having multiple risk factors, then the screening, repeat screening should be every three years, unless of course the individual has symptoms or there's a change in uh, risk factors. Um, and we now exclude point of care A1C testing for the diagnosis of diabetes. Um, when we think about the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, uh, we uh, updated our results based on a consensus report the American Diabetes Association and our European colleagues, EASD, published recently. And so some useful features for the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes are included, such as things like age less than 35 or history ketoacidosis, uh, significantly high blood glucose levels, um, and also recommendations about first degree uh, relatives of individuals diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, that there should be a discussion with them about the risks of uh, developing type 1 and uh, making sure they understand those issues. We also focused on genetic testing and specifically guidance around when to test for maturity onset diabetes of youth in children and young adults. Uh, individuals that represent a more uh, family history that would be suggestive of an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern should be genetically screened for MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young. 
And anybody, regardless of age, if they were diagnosed initially at, at six months or younger of age, they should be genetically tested as well. Because a number of these individuals we've found can um, sometimes not require insulin and have other therapies. Um, and then uh, uh, we also highlighted an important uh, aspect that there is a risk of insulin deficiency that can be precipitous and persistent in individuals that are treated with checkpoint inhibitor therapy, therapy that is used for the treatment of some cancers. So that was around diagnosis. Now we're going to move to prevention or delay of type 2 diabetes. And here we cover comorbidities as well. So what's new in this section? Um, there's an, an emphasis on the importance of individual risk benefit assessment. And this is based on recent studies that have suggested that the risk of some individuals uh, having prediabetes uh, and then going on to uh, uh, fully diagnosed diabetes varies in different risk groups. And therefore, one needs to individualize uh, who might be best uh, uh, assessed for their risk of diabetes and also for any potential treatment. Um, and then the diabetes prevention method measures uh, are really intended for individuals that fit the original DPP uh, and outcome studies. And those are generally people that are overweight or obese with an elevated risk of developing type two. Care goals for these individuals should include not only weight loss uh, and prevention of weight gain uh, and preventing the progression of hyperglycemia, but important considerations around cardiovascular risk and other comorbidity risk. So next we move to uh, the comprehensive medical evaluation assessment of comorbidities. So what's new in this section? Well, the, the, the two biggies here are really around COVID-19 vaccination recommendations. And those are recommendations that align with the Center for Disease Control. And then a greater emphasis on the uh, management of individuals with liver disease, uh, uh, both NASH and, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Moving right along, uh, the next uh, section that was updated includes facilitating behavior change and well-being to improve health outcomes. What's new in this section? Well, a recommendation around the use of technology that includes mobile apps, uh, simulation tools, digital coaching and digital self-management and uh, education and support interventions. Uh, and um, in, the, in the area of food, it is a, a more of an emphasis on food, uh, the quality of food sources. So uh, regardless of the carbohydrate intake levels, one needs to consider things like fiber content uh, in uh, carbohydrate and processing, uh, steering towards unprocessed foods. Next, uh, there's more information on the impact of uh, high protein and high fat mixed meals, meals that include both high protein and high fat, and the recommendations around individuals who take mealtime insulin, how to make adjustments for those types of meals. And there's a new section now around cognitive capacity and impairment, how to initially screen for that and when to refer for more formal assessment. Next, we move to glycemic targets. What's new around glycemic targets? And this is really a continuation of the importance of time and range and continuous glucose monitoring assessment of that time and range. The recommendations here are using 14 days as an assessment tool along with uh, A1C as we long advocated. There's a change in the language. Instead of talking about self-monitored blood glucose, really talking about blood glucose monitoring, and you'll see that throughout the document. And then um, 
time in range, time below range, and time in bo above range are really uh, no, uh, information that can be used to adjust therapy. Um, we also describe the literature that supports time and range being associated with microvascular complications of diabetes, um, and a greater emphasis on the hypoglycemia as an urgent issue that requires intervention, both guidance, education, strategies to avoid, and treatment adjustment. So that leads into uh, a, uh, an important area around diabetes technology. And so what are the new updates this year? There's a real emphasis on highlighting the need to individualize device recommendations and utilization. So one size does not fit all, and you'll see that through many of the recommendations uh, in the standards of care. And it's important that blood glucose monitoring needs to be provided to all those using continuous glucose monitors, whether that might be for calibration for devices that require that or verification of blood glucose uh, values when they're changing rapidly. Um, and, and also when a CGM may not be available. Um, the CGM recommendations uh, now combine both real-time and intermittent scanning systems. And so you'll see that the recommendations say uh, either one of those are recommended depending on the patient. And of course, we highlight the evidence uh, uh, for each of those types of devices. And either of those devices uh, should be offered to people with diabetes uh, adults with diabetes that are either on multi-dose insulin injections or continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions. And uh, we updated the recommendations to include those on basal insulin as well. CGM should also be offered for uh, youth with type 1 diabetes on either multi-daily uh, injections or continuous subcutaneous insulin. Uh, again, for those that are uh, capable and understanding how to use it. And we've indicated that insulin pens are preferred, but in certain situations, one could understand uh, the use of uh, uh, insulin syringes based on either access, cost, or uh, provider or caregiver preference. So that's the uh, technology piece. And now we'll move to the obesity management for the treatment of type two diabetes. And two changes here. The first um, is to affirm that there is a lack of evidence at this point to support the use of dietary supplements for weight loss. Uh, this was based on a comprehensive review of the literature. Um, the second uh, big update is guidance on post-bariatric surgery management. Uh, post-surgery follow-up, and in particular recommendations around hypoglycemia that can occur and the treatment of that hypoglycemia. So we're at about the halfway point. Uh, hopefully you're still with me. We have some really important information now to share about pharmacological treatment. And so let me move on to that. So the pharmacological treatment uh, for glycemic control uh, we'll start with type 1 diabetes. Uh, here, this information is based on a recently published uh, Joint American Diabetes Association and EASD consensus report, and you'll see that information reflected in these recommendations. First, in terms of insulin management, um, there are multiple different insulin management uh, options. And once again, this is about personalizing it to the individual that we are caring for. And the considerations here you can see are for each of those regimens, what, what the level of flexibility is, what the risk of hypoglycemia is, uh, and also uh, which ones might be higher cost versus lower cost. And the, the uh, recommendations here are for clinicians to weigh these different factors in helping uh, people with diabetes 
make the right choice and uh, uh, on which of these uh, therapies would be most effective for them. Um, you'll also see detailed information here on all of these uh, options, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, there are also an algorithm that speaks about beta uh, uh, insulin replacement therapy and transplantation, and you can see that it is based on whether an individual has uh, severe chronic kidney disease or on the uh, upper right here, a number of indications for transplantation and then discusses the different options that are available. So now I'm gonna to move to uh, treatment of type two diabetes. And this algorithm here, I'll highlight uh, uh, really the things that have uh, changed. You know, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, for all individuals, we recommend a lifestyle modification. We then move into particular therapeutic choices based on comorbidities. Um, and what I will highlight is that although metformin is generally the first line therapy, um, individuals may be put on other therapies based on their comorbidities, even in the absence of being on metformin. And so whether somebody has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or high risk, whether they have heart failure or chronic kidney disease, you can see the recommendations for uh, therapy. Um, and again, these are based on recent studies and the studies have been updated in the text of uh, the document. And then other considerations in terms of uh, initial therapy and further therapy, whether the, the, there's a big concern around hypoglycemia, um, whether weight gain is a particular issue or uh, cost and access are an issue. And again, these are guidelines uh, and recommendations to help clinicians work with their patients to identify what would be the right choice for that individual. Again, personalizing care. Uh, there's also an extensive table that describes the different medications uh, and various factors to consider in their use. Next, we'll move to cardiovascular disease and risk management. Uh, as you know, cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of uh, mortality in people with diabetes. This is an effort, uh, this uh, section was an effort with the American Cardi College of Cardiology who endorsed these recommendations uh, uh, with the American Diabetes Association. So um, I, I'm really excited about this uh, uh, figure because I think it really captures some very important concepts. Uh, and, and so when we're talking about reducing diabetes complications, it's really a multifactorial approach. Certainly, lifestyle modification and diabetes education is at the foundation of it all. Um, on the left, you can see uh, glycemic management important, but also important uh, are considerations around blood pressure, lipids, and agents that have been demonstrated to reduce cardiovascular disease and kidney disease that have specific benefit. So one needs to think holistically about the patient in terms of uh, uh, addressing all of these potential factors in their management. Um, other uh, new information is uh, the uh, consideration of and the rationale for combination therapy with uh, both SGLT2 medications and GLP-1 receptor agonists to address cardiovascular disease and kidney complications in individuals. Um, there's also an emphasis on how to um, approach management uh, for different patient subgroups, for example, new onset type 2 diabetes and the considerations that are different versus people uh, with existing uh, uh, diabetes regimens. 
Uh, there is also information pertaining to uh, newer medication, uh, uh, benpedoic ben acid in combination therapy for LDL lowering. And so now I'm going to shift to some special populations and what's new for them. And so we'll start uh, at one age of the end, age spectrum, and that's children and adolescents. And here you'll find specific recommendations for the screening and treatment of complications and related conditions uh, for both uh, pediatric uh, uh, patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And I refer you to that information. <clears throat> Also recommend automated insulin delivery systems should be offered to all youth with type 1 diabetes uh, and real, either real-time or in CGM should be offered to youth uh, with type 2 diabetes on insulin. The next special population are uh, the management of diabetes in pregnancy, and I'll highlight the new information there. Um, Updates were made regarding preconception and early pregnancy screening. Uh, in women who are planning pregnancy, those individuals should be uh, uh, with risk factors should be considered for screening for diabetes. Uh, and in many cases, screening all women for undiagnosed diabetes because it is quite common. Uh, before 15 weeks, um, should consider screening women with risk factors um, because they may have undiagnosed diabetes and therefore uh, be a benefit from screening early. Now I'm going to move to chronic kidney disease. Uh, this is a, a new section. We used to lump together all of microvascular complications in one uh, section and chronic kidney disease based on the evolving uh, science that has come deserves its uh, separate section. And so you'll see a lot more information there. Uh, in particular, for people that have chronic kidney disease and significant urinary albumin greater than 300 milligrams per day, um, Albuminuria should be a target in and of itself to be reduced by 30% or more to prevent progression. There's information about phenarinone to be used in people with albuminuric diabetic kidney disease uh, to, pre again, prevent progression. Um, and a major emphasis to categorize patients with chronic kidney disease, not only by their GFR, but also by measuring albuminuria. As far as retinopathy, neuropathy, and foot care, I'll highlight the, the big changes here. And that really is uh, an important consideration that uh, there have been a number of studies now, and they've indicated that there's no association between GLP-1 receptor agonist treatment and the development of retinopathy. Uh, there continues to be an association that's been well known for a number of years that anytime one rapidly reduces A1C uh, with whatever means, in essence, there's an increased risk of retinopathy, but uh, nothing unique to GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, and more emphasis uh, on screening intervals based on risk uh, of retinopathy. And again, individualizing uh, care based on that information. Um, we strengthened the wording uh, on the previous recommendations about the important use of uh, intravitreous injections of anti-vascular endothelial growth factor, anti-VEGF therapy, and um, uh, individuals uh, uh, that uh, can be considered who have uh, macular focal uh, um, or, or grid photocoagulation or intravitreal injection of corticosteroids, that may be a reasonable treat, treatment option for individuals that have persistent diabetic macular edema, despite uh, the usual therapies of anti-VEGF uh, treatment. Um, so that uh, actually brings us to the conclusion of this uh, uh, program. And I want to make you aware of a number of resources that we have. 
we we we're really excited to share this information with as many uh, individuals as possible. And that's why we share it in a variety of different ways. There is the full version of the standards of care that can be downloaded for free. All of these resources, by the way, are free. Uh, it is part of the mission of the American Diabetes Association to do this. We also have created a bridge version for primary care providers. There's a free app with an interactive uh, tool uh, that can be downloaded. There are pocket cards with some of the key figures. Uh, this free webcast uh, that you can receive continuing education for. And it, stay tuned for some new visuals and infographics that will make it uh, quicker to refer to some of the information that I described uh, today. So thank you so much for joining us and really appreciate and thank you all for everything you do for people living with diabetes. Thank you so much.